Welcome everyone to Climate Transformed Weekly Summary. Paul and I are going to go over what happened this week. We had two really awesome events and then give you a sneak peek into what's to come. Plus, this week we're doing a little news overview. So uh, buckle your seat belts. <laughs> was that cheesy enough? That was buckle your seat belts. Um, everybody, um, as you can tell, this is McKenna's first attempt at doing the introduction. She was very nervous. And, and buckle your seat belts, everyone. This is going. <laughs> this I is our, our, nice our thing for it. climate this week. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to unbuckle my seatbelt and talk a little, get you to talk a little bit about in the uh, the events we did this week. I um, McKenna did an interview at WSP um, with Anita Schwartz, who runs the circularity practice at WSP. So for those of you who don't know what WSP is. It is. I can't keep up. It's got, I think it's 55,000 global employees. They're the world's leading environmental engineering company. They're a consulting company. They're, a, they're, a, they're an environmental everything company. And they, they, I first came across them, A, because I've got a great friend who is a partner there um, who runs their landscape business. And he has this job of effectively going around the world and building park like parks in Helsinki and Monaco and um, Riyadh and all this sort of stuff. He, We've got a great job. Um, but uh, also when they are also working on a project called Helsinki um, 2050, and I spoke at a conference on that God, five, six years ago, uh, but fascinating group. Um, the, the content's interesting, um, but you have to appreciate when you watch the, the interview that this is, they think, they're thinking about what the world's going to look like in, in 20, 30 years' time. Um, so it's very much um, sort of, sort of not in the weeds it's sort of out there in terms of very conceptual and the like it's fascinating stuff um but it's uh, yeah sometimes if you're looking for something really really practical it's not what they do um again they're talking to the helsinki government about what the city's going to look like in 30 years time uh but it was interesting interesting stuff about about um, about the circular economy and the reverse circular economy i.e what do we do with all the returns that we do um in the garment industry sorry in the u.s retail in- industry mckenna they're was seven hundred and sixty-one billion dollars of returns done in twenty twenty, um, which is just a rem- three quarters of a trillion dollars of returns, and most of that stuff gets thrown away, landfills, yeah. all sorts of and stuff. It's, it's crazy. All the CPG companies are keeping up with the trends, and they know if they don't offer those returns, then people aren't going to buy from them. So it's like this weird, you know. They feel obligated to do that. Did you hear uh, that H and M? Speaking of news, that H H and M has have stopped making environmental claims on their on their fast retailing garments. Why? Um, because they're all bullshit, basically. Oh, okay. So, right. so yeah, so they've stopped. They've stopped actually making environmental claims that they you know which were pretty pronounced. Um, so it's interesting. You know, look again. Fast retailing is the scourge. Of, is the it makes it's just horrible for the for the textiles industry in terms of its decarbonization and sustainability efforts um and look i mean it, it, i think we've got to start making some choices in those in those areas right especially to reach the vision that like wsp has we need to start you know making those changes immediately because their vision is so powerful like if we followed everything they mentioned we could have this like perfect you know circular system where nothing is yeah <laughs> And perfect's the right word, right? And that's and again, it's hardly you know it's it's these are vision these these are visionary sort of presentations that they're doing to these major cities. Um, so um, can we have clean? Is there such a thing as clean mining? I don't think there is for someone who's had a commodities background for as long as I have. I don't. <laughs> well, what it was perfect is we had Ro on the uh, CEO of IC. Mm, and his one sentence answer for that question was coal. No, everything else, yes, of what in mining can be sustainable. So that was that was the summary. But overall, I, he really went into the uh, whole concept of you know, okay, on site is that sustainable? Transportation is that sustainable? Everything we do and have is mined at some point. So um, it was a really good talk. He's very engaging. And one thing I I meant, I wanted to mention is that he said, if you were to total off all the GHG um, from China's steel and cement, just those two industries alone, it's greater than all the emissions of Europe, including power, transportation, like individual company, everything. So 
China is a huge player in this, which I doesn't come as a surprise, but it was just like to put that metric in my head. I was like, wow, that's it. China, China, China laid down more cement, more cement between 2004 and 2009 than the United States did in the 20th century. Wow. Where are they putting crazy. all <laughs> Crazy. It's freaking incredible, right? It's just remarkable. And, and uh, you know, uh, you know, China, look again. You know, on a per capita basis, obviously the the, the U.S. is still a, you know a leading emitter versus China, but that's because China's got four times the population, which obviously comes into it. Um, but yeah, I, I I go I push back on a lot of this. I mean, you know, it's very hard with current mining practices. Um, you know, I, I go back to a place, a, a company we've spoken to a lot called Kabanga Nickel, which you know, in about a year's time, you know, Kabanga will be producing the cleanest nickel that they, you can produce out of Tanzania. Um, it's still not perfect, right? Now you're you're, chase, you're changing the smelting process from a, a hydrometal uh, from a hydrometal from a pyrometallurgy process, which is as it sounds, it's burning stuff, to a hydrometallurgy process, which is chemicals. Um, you still got to you still got to get got to get rid of the chemicals. You've still got to process that. Um, Mining's a dirty business. It's a it's it's a dirty business. Um, and- There's just so much involved in it. Just like with you know dipping it digging a huge hole in the earth but there are he did mention of course a lot of projects where they recovered enough where you wouldn't even know there's a mining site so it's, it was nice to see like the both sides of the of the issue yeah they look companies take this stuff seriously i mean and then you have slip ups like happen in australia all the time where rio tinto recently you know just dug up a aboriginal uh an aboriginal burial site Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes. so first, first Nations, like- they do this, you know, First Nation Australians get get the, you know, have had numerous sort of issues like this with large mining companies. So it's I think, I think, look, I think it's moving in the right direction. They are taking the stuff more seriously, but certainly it's two steps forward, one step back with with doing this. Um and obviously yeah. the big quandary is you can't decarbonize the world without a lot of stuff you need to dig out of the ground. I know all the elect- electric vehicles are like anything. All of that comes from mining. And going back to what you said, it, I had no idea it was legal to uh, have mining sites on World Heritage sites, but it is. And he's been trying to lobby that. But depends that just- on, yeah, it depends on, again, it depends on where you are. If those World Heritage sites are in Australia or if they're in Europe, no. If they're in, you know, mm. in, uh, you know, in other parts of the, if certain parts of the United States, yeah, maybe. Because uh, again, because the world, obviously, the world heritage is the world heritage sites are not mandated by sovereign governments. They're mandated by the UN, and in certain countries, the those countries aren't, don't recognize those UN sites. Exactly, and so, I know we're trying to speed up to these upcoming weeks. There, there's a news topic we wanted to talk. You had to share, right? Yeah, on um, this whole thing, this whole thing about Nord Stream, the, the sabotage of Nord Stream One, just shows how. The yeah you know, the energy transition remains such a vulnerable such a vulnerable um, uh, process in the in the uh, the EU. I mean, you know, the fact that it looks look it's hard to argue that it's not Russia has sabotaged their own pipeline. You know, seventy I think it was seventy meters underwater and blew up a p- section of the pipeline, which is which is crazy that this can still go on. And it goes back to this 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 really structural issue that Europe remains so vulnerable um, to the energy transition stalling because of its over-reliance on Russian gas. Um, And, you know, we can build a lot of wind farms, we can build a lot of solar farms. Um, Nuclear energy is just not going to come on quickly enough. There's not enough. You know, Germany just did a big deal on on energy with the UAE, but hasn't solved the problem that it doesn't have an LNG terminal, right? So how do you... Um, so these things are these things are a huge deal. I was chatting to my good friend Tony Lent, who was part of our um, part of our um, VCM conference, and he thinks this is the biggest geopolitical issue that we've seen in the last uh, in the last five years. So no, it's huge, yeah, and massive. it's going to incite so much, you know, more. <laughs> it's, yeah, just, this is this is not this is not stopping, and yeah, you know, and Europe's yeah you know, Europe Europe's energy problems aren't going to be as bad this winter. You know, Italy claims it's got enough gas to get through the winter, and that's great. But if this war drags on through 2023, how do you, how do you restock for the 2024 winter, which is the the big big problem with all of this? So um, so I'm glad we buckled I'm glad we buckled our seatbelts up for that one. Um, right. Um, um, next week, uh, next week integral group, and that is what integral group. Their um their whole thing is building decarbonization in electric 
electrification efforts um, and just for large portfolios and Tom Abram, he's a principal there and he'll be walking us through how to do that in the most effective way. And then the next U- event, which UBQ. I'm really excited about, Yes, UBQ, Rachel Barr, she's the VP of sustainability, and uh, their whole thing is claiming that they have the most climate positive thermoplastic material on the market. So we're going to dive into that and see what goes on behind the process. Brilliant. That's awesome. Uh, McKenna, this is great. We um, again, we're everyone. We're just busy sort of um, dealing with our our aftermath of our VCM conference. Um, We'll be launching a bunch of new products around that, um, including a weekly podcast on voluntary carbon markets, which we need to get, McKenna and I need to get organised. Everyone, thanks so much for for all your help. We really appreciate it, all the support. Um, Everything's on climatetransform.com. You know how to get there. Uh, McKenna, have a good week. You too. Bye. Later, bye.